Good morning, everyone. And welcome to another Canton Conversation. This is our 46th conversation and we're very happy to welcome you back. My name is Melissa Sutherland, Director at Canto, and I am your moderator this morning. Thank you for being with us. Our guest speakers today are Commission Director General Kendall Williams and Chris Taylor. This is a TCI uh, Commission Director General Kendall Williams and Chris Taylor from Consultant Sinerva. They will be sharing their expertise on our topic for this morning which is mitigating risk to communications networks and services in disasters and emergencies. Just a little bit of background on both um, Kenva and Chris. So Mr. Kenva Williams, the Turks and Caicos Islands Telecommunications Commission Director General, is a telecommunications professional with over 20 years of work experience in engineering and technology. He has represented the commission both regionally and internationally and is well known in the regulatory community. Chris Taylor is a partner in the consultants and regulatory training firm, Sinerfa. He advises on a range of issues across regulated sectors. He has extensive international experience of managing relations with senior industry regulatory and political stakeholders. So these will be our panelists for this morning on the issue of mitigating risk to communications networks and services in disasters and emergencies. And we all know that the Caribbean is an area that is prone particularly to hurricanes. And our season does start shortly in June. So this is a timely presentation. Um, on a matter of housekeeping, please post your questions in the chat. And at the end of the presentation, we will read your questions and respond to as many questions as possible. Um, if we do have more questions and we have time to answer, we will see how we can get back the answers to you as possible. You will hear from me again at the end of the presentation. And just now, I will hand over to the Commission's Director General, Kenva Williams, to take you through the presentation along with Chris Taylor. Ladies and gentlemen, enjoy. I'll be back with you at the end of the presentation to take you through our question and answer session. Please think about your questions. Please post them in the chat. We will address them. Thank you so very much. Enjoy. I'll be back with you in a few minutes. Well, in, in a, a couple of minutes. Thank you so very much. Over to you, Ken Bob. Yes, good morning. Thanks, Melissa. Um, good morning. Um, I'm delighted to be joining Kento colleagues for the session together with Chris Taylor to talk about the telecommunication emergency preparedness and response policy we established to mitigate risks to telecommunications network and services which arise in emergencies and disasters. Of course, this, this policy makes provision for any kind of disaster, but of course, we particularly focus on vulnerability of our islands, our communities, and our network and services which arise during the hurricane season. As you know, we experienced a devastating hurricane season in 2017 with Hurricane Irma and Maria. Our island suffered substantial damage, including sufficient telecommunication infrastructure damages, connectivity loss between the islands and significant service outages. The restoration was very challenging. Before the storm as regulators, we would request service providers plan to review the preparedness procedures, which we found very similar and slightly different as it relates to their procedures. After, some, after the storm, some of the challenges we discovered were no effective collaboration, non-effective collaboration between the government and service providers. Import, importation of service telecommunication network, of course, was a challenge and frustrating to some. During this period, due to the storm impact on service providers experienced damages, one service provider experienced damages to their secondary network. And of course, we have boat digital inflow. One of the service providers allowed infrastructure sharing on their secondary network because the primary network had failed. This arrangement certainly was discontinued. And because of the discontinued, one of the service providers lost all connectivity to their services. Because the commission wished for this not to happen, we tasked the service providers to establish an emergency preparedness agreement 
for infrastructure sharing and resources to protect the resilience of emergencies on their, on their primary calls and emergency services. To support the EPA, the Emergency Preparedness Agreement, the Commission agreed to establish a telecommunication preparedness policy, which we are about to discuss today. I'll now hand over to our expert, Sonova, to go into the methodology that we used to establish the policy. The policy was established with a working group between the Commission, Sonova, the DME, Flow, and Digicel. Chris? Okay, uh, thank you very much, um, Kemva, and thank you very much, uh, Director Sutherland, for that introduction. Um, uh, as Kemva's explained, we're going to talk you through um, the project. Kemva's explained a lot of the reasons why um, we undertook this work and why the Commission um, initiated the project to create this policy uh, to mitigate risks um, through disasters and emergencies in Turks and Caicos Islands. Uh, I'm just going to recap that a bit. Um, and then the agenda after that, when we've looked at this introduction and the reasons, I'm going to take you through the methodology we followed, um, how we approached the work, and then I'm going to present a little bit about um, the telecoms emergency preparedness and response policy and the emergency prepar preparedness agreement, which, it, which the, the two come together in a package. Uh, I'm going to talk you through some of the key features. Um, that will have to be a bit of a summary because uh, they're both quite extensive documents. Um, the policy is in any case, uh, and we only have you know an hour for this call and we'll have a opportunity for discussion and questions at the end. So I'll just give you the highlights um, though you can study uh, the policy at your leisure on the commission's website. And when we get to the culmination of this presentation, you'll see that the, uh, the hyperlinks are included um, with the slides. Going to talk a bit about other work, um, which we've identified as a result of this work, um, some of which is outside of the telecommunications sector, but we've liaised and we've made recommendations with the Commission to the Government of TCI for work in other areas, just to complement the work that we've done, which is focused particularly on the, um, uh, on the telecommunications sector. Uh, and then we'll have a wrap up and I hope we have plenty of time to answer any questions you have or pick up any points of discussion. So just, just by way of introduction, I can be very uh, brief here because Kemba's um, covered some of this in his introductory remarks. Um, but the reason the Commission has done this work uh, and that we supported the Commission doing this work is to mitigate risks to communications networks and services uh, in disasters and emergencies, uh, and it establishes a policy framework. So when we go through the requirements of the telecoms emergency preparedness and response policy, you'll see that it is a framework within which the sector, um, the two big operators, Digicel and Flow and the Commission, uh, can, uh, can manage risks both during uh, emergencies, but also in preparation for emergencies. Uh, as we all know, uh, when we get to this point in the year um, in the region, you don't know yet whether the hurricane season is going to affect your island uh, or how bad the hurricane season is going to be. Uh, and so a lot of this uh, framework is about preparedness for things that may or may not happen during the season. And there's a framework there for that. Uh, as Kenvers said, the policy also envisages an emergency preparedness agreement. Now, whereas the policy um, is a, a document created by the Commission, um, essentially to kind of govern the arrangements for mitigation and management of disasters and emergencies, the emergency preparedness agreement is an agreement between Digicel and Flow. Um, I'll come on to that when we when we speak about it later in this presentation. And in fact, colleagues from Digicel and Flow are very welcome to come in and give their perspective on, on this as well. But this is an agreement. It only is effective during emergencies. So during the period between the declaration of an emergency by the governor and the ending of that declaration, this emergency preparedness agreement will be live. So it doesn't cover any kind of BAU. It doesn't touch on any kind of commercial 
interconnection arrangements between digital and digital and flow it is there specifically only for emergencies um and uh director sutherland or others who have been involved in this work for for digital and flow may want to give their perspective on that um they're very welcome to just move the slides on uh again talking a bit more about the reasons for this um the genesis for this really is 2017, um, when the islands found themselves in the path of two big hurricanes, um, Irma and Maria. And as everyone will remember, they followed in close succession um, uh, and they resulted in devastation. And as Kemba's described, loss of service um, on the telecoms network and telecoms services. And that was difficult to restore. Now, what, what I think is important to emphasize is the point at the bottom of this slide. The emergency uh, preparedness and response policy cannot prevent services being affected by hurricanes and other natural disasters. That would be unrealistic. Um, clearly, there are going to be things that happen in extreme weather conditions or other types of disaster uh, emergencies, which you just cannot plan for. And there will be damage which you haven't foreseen. Um, so what this does is it puts in place uh, and it documents very clearly arrangements to mitigate or reduce the risks of damage and then to uh, and then to react to them through restoration and other activities after the event. So uh, as I'll explain, it takes you through preparation, um, you know, operations, standard operating procedures during uh, an emergency and then after that the recovery period, restoration of services and so on. But it would be obviously unrealistic for us to pretend that this policy can prevent those uh, that damage from happening in, 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 a, in a disaster scenario. Um, hopefully, uh, it reduces the risk that, that that damage is going to be catastrophic or can't be, um, can't be remedied quickly. So I'm going to move on now and talk a bit about um, how we approach this work uh, and it might be worth saying a little bit about Sinerva, um, which is the company I'm working with on this um, in doing so. Um, so Sinerva, I mean some of you know us through the region, um, we are active in a number of kind of regulatory settings and also technical, technical implementation of regulatory rules, so things like number portability but, but also regulatory policy advice. Um, as well as that we have a, a training business um, and we have a global network of associates uh, and, and consultants who work with us. Now, through that global network, we have some experience of, 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 of advising clients on disaster and emergency management, um, but much more in the South Pacific uh, uh, than in the Caribbean region. Um, even so, with that experience, we set about speaking to the Commission about the sort of support we might be able to provide to them. Um, and, and we set out our methodology and essentially this is the methodology which we followed through the project. Um, I think it's worth saying that when we started this, we, we did quite a lot of just desk research as well as speaking to um, our network. And whilst there is a lot of activity around um, management of telecommunications emergencies and disasters around the globe, there aren't very many um, good examples or precedent of a fully baked and fully finished um, emergency preparedness and response policy. And so I think what we've what we've done with the Commission in TCI, you know, is, is actually produce something of which there aren't many examples around the world, even in kind of emergency hotspots. Um, there aren't that many complete um, telecoms emergency planning facilities, documents and rules. So um, when we were looking around the world for precedent, we didn't found, find all that much, but we did look at what there is and pull out what we regarded as best practice. And then as any good consultant will, we tried to apply that best practice quite selectively. So we, we realized Turks and Caicos Islands is not the same as Samara, it's not the same as other uh, jurisdictions where we found examples of telecoms emergency management. So anything that we found then had to be adapted to uh, local jurisdiction, local rules, the local regulatory framework, and the and the local stakeholder landscape as well. Uh, and so, with with the commission, 
we, we attempted to follow that approach in developing these rules. Um, we found some national emergency telecoms plans. Uh, as I've mentioned, uh, we looked in the Pacific because we had some experience through an associate of ours in Samoa. Um, there is a plan there, but it's unfinished. Um, it's in draft uh, and, and the status is it, it remains to be completed some years after having been started. Um, we looked at the framework in the USA. Um, so there, as you would expect there, there is quite a detailed um, system at the federal level and at the state level for managing emergencies and disasters. And FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency sits at the center of that. So we looked at the documentation there um, uh, we looked at um, other jurisdictions as well, um, including in Europe and the UK, um, which is where I'm based, but clearly um, looking at emergency management in the UK doesn't have a great deal of resonance in the region because we're not, uh, we, we're not um, prone or subject to the same types of rev weather emergencies as you are in the Caribbean region. Um, and so the UK, for example, looks much more at terrorist incidents than it does at weather emergencies. But we took all of these things in the round um, and we conducted a, a, a desk research to see what was the best of the best out there and whether we could bring it to Turks and Caicos Islands. Um, the most significant thing um, is that the ITU has done a lot of work on this um, uh, and some of, uh, and I think the ITU has done some excellent work with 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 consultants as well, in applying its best practice rules and advising um, governments and regulators around the world on how they've done that. Um, but we took the ITU guidelines, which are published uh, uh, online, and I would encourage every everyone who has an interest in this to look at those guidelines, because I think they set a really really excellent generic framework obviously which needs to be applied differently in each jurisdiction um, uh, and we, we looked at those guidelines and we've used them as a really strong reference reference point or even an anchor in our work with the commission in the TCI. Um, you'll see on the right of that slide there's a screenshot of the guidelines and they're called the ITU guidelines for national emergency telecommunication plans. Um, just a note on you know semantics here Generally, if you look around the world at these sorts of documents, they tend to be called an NETP, a National Emergency Telecommunications Plan. Um, they are equivalent to what we have called the Telecoms Emergency um, uh, Preparedness and Response Plan, the TEPRP. So uh, don't kind of be misled or put off by the fact that the ITU generally refers to an NETP and we have a TEPRP, the two documents roughly achieve the same type of things, i.e. a policy framework within which you can look at mitigating risks in emergencies. Uh, we also um, looked at what already exists in the Turks and Caicos Islands. Um, and actually there is a, a, a mature set of documents and guidance under the auspices of the Department of Disaster Management and Emergencies. I'll refer to them as DDME from now on. And so uh, within, the, within the DDME, um, I guess within their oversight, there is, firstly, there's a, um, a disaster management ordinance 2015. And as you can imagine, the DDME sit at the center of administering that. Um, uh, within, within those auspices, there's a national disaster management plan. Um, now it's important to say that national disaster management plan covers the whole of the economy and the whole of society in TCI, whereas we're looking quite narrowly to a, a very important sector, we're looking at telecommunications sector. So the National Disaster Management Plan, you know, is cross-sectoral and doesn't focus in particular in uh, at telecoms. Uh, during our research, we read that plan uh, and associated documentation thoroughly and we pulled out what was relevant to telecoms and almost the first thing in our terms of reference was don't, don't rewrite rules that already exist you know don't don't break something that's already fixed um, and so what we've ended up with um, and I think colleagues in DDME were, were were active in the discussions and would agree with this is is a framework for telecoms which is complementary to what already existed um, under the National Disaster Management Plan um, overseen by the DDME. So we have something which sits alongside that rather than 
uh, duplicating it or or um, or trying to replace it in any way. Um, so the, that uh, national disaster management plan actually has seven sub plans. Um, again, if you look on the DDME website, you can find all of these, but they cover specific situations. So there, there's one for hurricanes, as you'd expect. There's one for tsunami. Um, there are communications plans within that. So there's there's a big document set already there in TCI. Uh, and we obviously, as part of our work, wanted to absolutely respect that with the Commission, take account of it, work together with stakeholders so that we came up with a product that complemented that, that, that existing set of arrangements rather than any in any way contradicting it. Um, and as I've mentioned, we looked at equivalent documents in other jurisdictions, though uh, there aren't many of those, actually. Um, there are some, and I think there's there will probably be more in the coming years as different national governments um, and national regulators adopt the ITU guidelines, for example. But um, at the moment, TCI are probably a bit ahead of the game um, as a result of this project. Um, so carrying on with methodology, uh, I'll tell you a few things that you already know. So um, they engaged Sinerva, which, which was myself um, principally and my colleague Justin Lepaterel, um, to support this work, developing the, uh, the policy and also the emergency preparedness agreement. Um, uh, and, and early on, the, we agreed and the commission, uh, the commission decided um, that we would convene a working group to take this work forward um, clearly it is a multi-stakeholder effort um, it's something which doesn't just exist within the telecoms regulator uh, it also is clearly very important to the private sector to the operators within the sector which are principally digicel and flow um, in tci and then also ddme who I've already mentioned, they are obviously a stakeholder in what we're doing. Uh, and the Commission wanted to take those stakeholders on the journey with us, consult them on the journey rather than come up with a product and then impose it at the end. So we convened a working group um, which which sat uh, every fortnight, I recall, or um, if it needed special special sittings, it did. Uh, and we th I haven't actually got the timeline with me, but we started this work in May um, and the, the working group ran through the summer to October. So um, it was it, it was quite quick and intensive and, and I would say quite an efficient arrangement for co-working between the regulator and other stakeholders to develop this work. Um, we, together with the commission, were holding the pen. So we did the drafting of the uh, the telecoms emergency preparedness and response policy, but we shared drafts at each, each step with the working group. Uh, and we actually included a, a sort of standstill of six weeks where we put out uh, a, a late draft of the policy um, to the working group and other stakeholders. And there was a six week consultation period before we finished it. So um, I like to think that we were successful in ensuring that everyone who needed to be consulted and needed to buy into this set of arrangements um, could do so. Um, we also, I think it's worth managing, mentioning, so DDME is, is, is the lead government organisation for disaster planning and management, um, but we also engaged with central government um, through the responsible minister and, and his private secretary. Uh, and so there was you know, part of this, as well as the technical work of, of, of creating the policy, a big part of this project was stakeholder management and ensuring that everyone who needed to be brought into our work was brought into our work. Um, moving on to the emergency preparedness agreement. So uh, as Kemba and I have described this, this isn't something that the Commission is going to produce. It is an agreement between Digicel and Flow. Um, and it will facilitate collaboration between them. It will facilitate facility sharing where that's needed, um, either to maintain services or restore services, but only during a period of emergency. You know, it, it, absolutely, to be fair to industry, this is not in any way, um, a, you know, a method through which any, you know, any kind of collaboration or facility sharing could be imposed outside of an emergency It is only to cover safety of life and extreme situations. Um, and 
as part of our work in the working group, we produced a draft of the EPA, a sort of framework, heads of terms type of draft. Um, and that, uh, that piece of work is now with Digicel and Flow um, to develop. Uh, and clearly the commission is keeping in touch with them on how it's going periodically. Okay, so I'm going to move on to explain um, some key features of the, the policy. Uh, this is a real, I think I've, th this is summarized in two slides. Uh, I, I would encourage you, if you're interested, um, to look at the Commission's website and the full document set, because you'll see the detail there. Um, in developing these requirements, we have done our very best to keep them simple, um, particularly because I think, you know, as, as an emergency approaches or potentially a, a potential disaster approaches, people don't particularly want to be wading through, you know, a 50 page document of small print full of footnotes and, and, and appendices and so on. So the, the main policy document I think you'll find is sort of 25, 30 pages long, but we then produced a synopsis of that, which is just the requirements. Um, and, and, and that is very simply just meant to be something you can pick up when you need to uh, and reasonably concise and hopefully clearly written. So whilst this is a complex, quite a complex subject, um, the Commission has tried to recognise that when people are trying to execute plans um, and their organisation may be under all kinds of stresses and strains um, because of an impending weather event, for example, um, there needs to be a clear document and one that is reasonably easy to pull out the drawer and read. Um, but if you look at the full document set, it's all available on the uh, Commission's website. And I'm just going to summarise some of the key points um, here. Um, so the, the Telecom's Emergency uh, Preparedness and Response Policy establishes an emergency management framework. There are 20 requirements in there. So I'm sort of hoping that those of you on the call will think, well, 20, that's that's a management, a manageable number of things for an organization to look at um, when they're trying to um, take action to, to mitigate risks of emergency. The first of these really is the key one, I think. It's right at the center of the arrangement. So um, both both of the main operators, Digicel and Flow, under the policy are, are required um, each, each year before the hurricane season. So as you mentioned, Melicia, Melicia mentioned we're looking at, you know, from June onwards, um, uh, each of the networks has to um, report to the commission um, on their preparedness for the, uh, for the upcoming hurricane season. And the requirement in TCI under this policy is for that to happen by the end of April. Um, the Commission uh, will then um, audit or check or, or, you know, basically assess and evaluate those plans and it will then produce its own report, the Telecom Sector Disaster Vulnerability Report by the end of May. Um, and there may be some vulnerabilities which the Commission identifies, in which case it will discuss them with the oper operators and a kind of remedial plan can be uh, agreed to to mitigate those risks where they are capable of mitigation. So there is this set piece, you know, at the start of each season, um, which prepares for the hurricane season in the islands. Um, I should say, actually, because we are we're naturally focusing on on weather events and, and particularly hurricanes, which I think is right. Um, but the policy is capable of being flexed and it covers not just hurricane scenarios, but other scenarios as well, um, particularly those which might affect networks, telecoms networks and telecom services. So that's the first um, of our requirements that I wanted to emphasize. Um, it includes the requirement to create and maintain asset inventories by the operators so they know um, what kit they have available, um, what mobile units they have, for example, for restoration of mobile infrastructure, masts and so on. Um, it requires the system, the uh, maintenance of early warning systems um, and alerts, uh, and those can um, adopt the uh, common alerting protocol. 
um, the CAP, which is an international system by which emergency communications can be sort of pushed out through any me any any medium, be it SMS or or online or other types of broadcast. So um, the uh, the sector in TCI has discretion to adopt the common alerting pro protocol um, if that if that is appropriate, and that's written into the arrangements in the policy. Um, there are clauses requiring support to consumers and citizens with specific needs. Um, and so each of the operators will look to identify any customers who are particularly vulnerable and help them in whatever way they can uh, during an emergency or disaster scenario. Now, what we haven't done in the policy, and this was the subject of quite a bit of discussion in the working group, as others will recall, what we haven't done is been overly prescriptive about what Digicel and Flow must do in these circumstances. So how they support their vulnerable customers is up to them, um, but we would expect that they obviously they need to support all of their customers and the whole community through a disaster or an emergency. But the, the requirement here is for them to know who's vulnerable and do what they can to help those uh, vulnerable customers during an emergency. There is then a section which covers uh, restoration. And this is really where the emergency preparedness agreement is going to be very important because this is where there might need to be some coordination for restoration of facilities. Um, imagine, for example, there is coverage um, of one network in, in, um, in, in, in Grand Turk um, and uh, uh, not another. Um, then you know there might be a need for coordination of uh, efforts to to restore services where they're most needed, where there is a complete network outage, for example, and there may be during emergencies uh, a a facility for national roaming. So if the network is down for one operator, you can use the other other operator's network. Again, this is purely an emergency management. Um, a, man a management facility and not something that the Commission is trying to impose under business as usual circumstances. Uh, there are requirements for provision and dissemination of information um, to citizens and to customers. Uh, there are a lot of uh, requirements that come under the general heading of standard operating procedures, which the Commission is going to expect the operators to have in place each year. For example, trainings and drills, practice and so on, to ensure that the organisation um, is ready um, for uh, emergency events if and when they're approaching. I should say, uh, you know, again, colleagues from Digital and Flow might want to come in when the meeting is open. A lot of that exists already. So these organisations already have facilities in place to ensure that the staff know what to do in emergencies. It's just that by creating this policy, uh, we've sort of centrally documented that as a requirement. Um, the EPA is a requirement under the policy. I think, I hope I've already described that clearly, so I don't need to describe it again here. Um, these requirements will be enshrined in the two licenses or the, or the licenses of Digital and Flow. I know each of them have more than one license in the TCI actually, but this will be enshrined in, in Digital and Flow licenses um, to, uh, to give it teeth. Though under the telecoms ordinance, um, the, uh, the Commission has the power to, 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 make, to take whatever arrangements it needs to um, in an emergency to protect services and infrastructure. And then, as I've said, we we really, you know, we did use the ITU um, guidelines as a, uh, as a as an anchor here. And so you'll find that if you look at the emergency preparedness and response policy, it maps onto the, disaster, the four phases of disaster management identified by the ITU. And some of you might be familiar with this. Um, the four phases are the mitigation phase and the preparedness phase. Now we found actually those two phases kind of overlap. You know, these are both things that happen before um, before a disaster. You take steps to mitigate, and then you take steps to prepare. Um, there is then the response phase, which really is live. These are the live uh, live management of the situation as it develops and in the eye of the storm, literally in the eye of the storm, and then the recovery phase afterwards when there will be activities to. Um, 
to restore services where that's needed um, and to ensure that infrastructure is intact, e even, even if service is still intact, to ensure that infrastructure remains safe um, and so on. So that's, that is a, that's what I'm going to say for now on the key features of the policy. Um, as I've said a couple of times already, if you read the documents, they're available on the, uh, on the Commission website. Um, one of the things we did with, again, with reference to the ITU uh, guidelines is a gap analysis. And this is a summary of, of our gap analysis before and after we had created um, and, uh, and put the, the policy in place. Um, that's probably a little bit of a small print and busy slide for people to read live. Uh, and equally, because of time, I'm not going to go through it point by point. But what you see on the left of this slide is 11 recommendations, which you will also find in the ITU guidelines. Now, I've summarized them for this presentation because the, the recommendations themselves are sometimes like three or four sentences long and, and you couldn't fit them on one slide. Um, the, the middle column is the uh, where we where we assessed the TCI disasters and emergencies framework before we started work on the policy uh, and hopefully you'll understand the red amber green the rag traffic light system here where um, red obviously would indicate um, a situation that needs rectifying urgently and which is really suboptimal um, amber is there is some room for improvement and green means that the status of the issue is is healthy so um, you'll see actually that uh, TCI was not in a bad place you know we haven't got any red in that middle col column but we do have a lot of amber flags there and then through uh, implementation of the uh, the policy we've moved those to green so we have taken action the commission has taken action in each case where there is an amber um, to create the circumstances in which we can say yes that risk has arrangements in place to mitigate it um, i should probably sound a note of caution at this point because this is a this is a desk exercise what hasn't happened is um is is for for us to live through uh a, a hurricane season since the creation of this and completion of this document and clearly what hasn't happened and and let's hope we don't see it this year or in the foreseeable future is for there to be a real emergency with with a hurricane um hitting the islands directly so uh this system has not been tested live yet but in terms of where we found uh where we identified there to be weaknesses in the tci mitigation plan We've turned those ambers to green through um, implementation of the policy, and we hope we hope that those will be real mitigations rather than just desk exercise mitigations. Um, I'm going to I'm going to just uh, I can go through some of these. I think we have a little bit of time. So, um, for example, ITU recommendation one um, it covers current capabilities um, and geographic mapping of telecoms infrastructure which might be vulnerable um, so I think there was some hazard mapping in the TCI but it wasn't documented and we've now moved it to, 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 to a documented status by um, creation of the policy um, recommendation two covers the phases of disaster management again that wasn't really documented in the CCI so we now have a clear documented plan which uh, which takes the stakeholders in the island through um, each of the four phases of disaster management, uh, mitigation, preparedness, response and recovery, as I've just explained. Uh, recommendation three covers arrangements for administration and communication. Again, um, that wasn't clearly documented. It is now much more so. Uh, ITU recommendation four was covered legislation and regulation. Um, we are now going to enshrine these rules in the licenses of Digicel and Flow. And so we've moved that, I think, from an amber status to green. Um, contingency plans, existing network contingency plans. Uh, we've now created a much more centralized system for that. And, and I must say, um, when we started this project, I probably should have said this already, Digicel and Flow both uh, shared with us um, confidentially their, their emergency um mitigation plans and so there were arrangements there 
there was no kind of centralized coordination point. So I think, you know, I, I, sh I should do credit to all stakeholders here. Um, a lot of this thinking had been done. There was an exercise here, though, to bring it together and consolidate it and create it, create a centralized system, you know, within, within the line of sight and under the auspices of the regulator. Um, early warning systems were in place for both networks. Um, so that's green to green. Um, international cooperation and um, and coordination. Uh, there, there's, there's, there is an international framework around um, managing disasters and support to other jurisdictions managing disasters. And a lot of that covers um, emergency provisions for importation of equipment for restoration of networks, um, a thing called the Tampair Convention. Now, the Commission has spoken to the government of TCI at length on that. Um, and as a result of those discussions, we, we've mit mitigated some of the risk that we identified there. Uh, training capacity building, as I said, those things were already in place. They're now documented in the policy, but that, that was green. It remains green, obviously. Um, arrangements of people with specific needs, as I've said, uh, those things are now in place under the policy requirements for each operator to do what they can to support um, particularly vulnerable customers. Cybersecurity, uh, it's, a, it's an ITU recommendation. It's not an area that we particularly looked at in any detail in our work. We know that both operators have cybersecurity protections in place um, and that those are capable of withstanding emergencies. So green to green. Um, uh, and then recommendation 11, fi 11 finally covering practice exercises and drills. Um, arrangements for those were in place already. So again, green to green. So hopefully that tells you that the um, the creation of this policy has added value, particularly in centralizing um, and document and creating documented centralized arrangements. Um, but uh, what we what we found in TCI was that we're in a reasonably good place. You know that we're, we don't have red risks against those ITU recommendations. Okay, so I'm going to move us on now to just I'm, I'm, I'm approaching the end of this presentation. Um, we did identify some associated work as a result of um, speaking to the Commission um, and with other stakeholders. Uh, and the first one is around the uh, review of arrangements for importation of essential telecoms equipment in emergencies. I mean, to be frank, both Digicel and Flo told us that they found stuff getting held up um, uh, um, in the ports when they were trying to get stuff in in 2017 to fix their networks. Um, they couldn't get it through um, customs and uh, the bureaucracy around normal bureaucracy around importation of equipment. Um, there is, uh, I think, potential to improve that. There are some discussions going on in government. Kenva may be able to update us, but actually, you know, I think that's outside of the core responsibility of the telecoms regulator, and clearly it's with the controller of customs. But that is an area that we, as a result of this work, have been, have been engaged through the commission, obviously, with the government of TCI. Uh, there is uh, a, a recommendation we've made for engagement with um, the Caribbean Disaster Emergency and Management Agency, CDEMA, um, and really just to brief them on how the policy was created and the approach we took to creating it. Um, that's with the government. I think DDME will uh, lead on that. And then, uh, as I mentioned at the start of this um, presentation, uh, there is a big document set already um, under the oversight of DDME. Some of those documents probably could do with updating or some of them are, are in draft and, and incomplete. So we we recommended that uh, that the government and DDME take a look at those as well. Those are obviously outside of Kenva's day job and the Commission's day job. Their recommendations that he's made, things that we found through our work on the uh, to create the policy and recommendations we've made into central government. Um, so just in closing, uh, there is a, it's a status report. So um, we finished creating the emergency preparedness and response policy in November 21. And it's there, it's, it's live. Um, any of you can, can look at it through that link, which is included in the slides. The emergency preparedness agreement, which you'll recall is the agreement for facility sharing um, and other types of collaboration only um, in emergency scenarios. 
Digicel and Flow are working on that based on a, um, a framework which we provided to them through the working group. Um, and then finally, I mean, this isn't really for me, but as, as I'm the one off mute, I will, I will say it as a consultant to the commission, I think it's appropriate to kind of acknowledge that it, this development was quite quick. It happened through last spring and summer um, and was completed in the winter. It's fairly intensive work. It was collaborative, um, and and I think um, I think the commission would want to thank industry, Digital Flow, and also other stakeholders for for the collaborative effort in getting us from where we were to where we are now. Um, and that completes the presentation. So you know we've got fifteen minutes left, and uh, myself and Kemva would be very happy to take questions from from anyone. Thanks very Thank much, you. Director Sutherland. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Ken, for taking us through mitigating disasters and emergencies in the Turks and Caicos Islands and taking us through that process um, of collaboration between industry, regulator and government um, to get to the place now where both Flo and Digicel are working through the emergency preparedness agreement. Thank you so very much for that. So ladies and gentlemen, to remind you, you can put your questions in the chat. I do have a question in the chat that I will be reading for you shortly and having the panelists respond. Um, before I go ahead and do that, I do have some um, updates for you on counter developments that I would want you to uh, listen to ahead of the questions um, for Chris and Kenva. And that will also give you an opportunity to digest the presentation a bit and to put your questions in the chat. So let me just update you on what's coming up for Canto um, that we want you to take note of, um, especially first and foremost, we want to talk about our conference that's coming up in July. Now, as you know, Canto has the premier telecoms conference for the Caribbean every year. We always have great speakers and everybody leaves with something, including great networking opportunities. So our 37th annual conference and trade exhibition will be held from July 17th to 20th in Miami, Florida. And we are planning that this, of course, as you can see, will be face-to-face -face at the Fontainebleau Hotel. So we will post more details on the conference for you, but you can always follow us on canter.org and on our social media pages, but we'll let you know more about it, but we want you to put it in your calendars from now, July 17th to 20th, Miami, Florida, Canto Conference and Trade Exhibition. So we want you to take note of that. But coming up before then, we will have the Canto Regulatory Master Training course, um, along with Sinerva. So Sinerva and Canto are partnering in this very good program that begins on the 10th of May. So if you want to learn some more about the policy considerations for the digital economy and the potential solutions of policymakers and regulators to develop a balanced, efficient, and coordinated approach to regulating in this complex environment, please register for this program, um, Sinerva and Cantor's Regulatory Master Training Course. Again, that is from May 10th. You can call for further information, but even more convenient, just go to Canto, just email us at canto at canto.org, and we will send you the information, and Canto members do get discounted rates on these programs. So please remember this. I will tell you a little bit more about our next conversation after the questions. So let me just go back into questions for Chris and Ken Bob. Chris and Kenva, you can decide whether either or both of you address the question. So the first question I have here, and again, um, ladies and gentlemen, just a reminder that you can share your questions in the chat. Chris, Kenva, the first question here is, what were the challenges engaging all stakeholders across government and industry in the TEPRP project? So again, what were the challenges engaging all stakeholders across government and industry in the TEPRP project? Uh, thanks. Um, 
the, there wasn't any challenges at all, um, surprisingly. Um, the policy certainly was supported by our ministry, supported by the minister, and it was supported by the industry flow and did itself well, um, going through the experience we went through during Hurricane Arm and Maria. They, they understand the importance of such policy. Um, the stakeholders, to include DDME, they support it as a part of the stakeholders. And so NOVA, um, certainly when we looked around the, the region, um, internationally and locally, um, there wasn't such a policy like, like Chris mentioned. And so the excitement of developing such a policy um, to set procedures and guidelines for us to, to follow within the Caribbean, um, everyone was excited about the, this initiative. And so there wasn't any, any, any challenges at all. Can, can I just add something on that? Oh. Th thanks, Kenva. So, yeah, I, I agree. Um, uh, th there were no big challenges. I think it's quite unusual because I'm a consultant. I work in a lot of regulatory settings and usual, usually in regulation, you will have, you know, potentially adversarial situations between the regulator and industry or one operator and another operator incumbent versus new entrants and so on. Clearly, in this sort of work, it is in everyone's interests to kind of, you know, get it right, um, because um, during an emergency, you know, the, the usual kind of rules are, uh, or, or the normal operating circumstances, you know, are no longer there, and we're looking at safety of life um, and uh, preservation of essential communications. So I think it's really helpful that you know, everyone's incentives are aligned there rather than people having slightly different incentives. Um, so I agree with you, Kenva, that, that, uh, that, that, that the challenges were not great and hopefully that helped. What, one thing that does um, sometimes come up though is just that people have 101 other things on their desk, you know, millions of other priorities. Um, and so you need, you know, you need to find someone and make it their day job to, to get this done. Thank you, Ken, but thank you, Chris. I do have a, a follow-up question from this, though. Um, do you think, though, that if, if the operators had to do this between themselves, that it would turn out as well as having the regulator operating as that um, authority that pulls everybody together? I think it perhaps would have it would have happened, but in the time frame we were able to establish the, um, this policy, um, it's important to have collaboration, and that's what the, the commission is and the, the regulators established for is to collaborate. Um, yes, there are collaboration between the, the service providers uh, within, but it's also add you know support as a regulator be there to to show oversight, um, to encourage the, the working together, and, and 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 so such a policy can be. Uh, finish and concluded in a in a rapid um, time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Tendo. Please I've, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I mean, I, I think as well. Um, I mean, D Director Sutherland. So you 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 were part of this. You, you know, you were very active during this work with your other hat on, working for Flow. Um, yes. and, and so you can tell me if I'm wrong. But uh, I I I think that at the start of this project. Um, industry recognized the need to collaborate but while looking for a kind of central policy framework within which they could then yes. do that and yes. so you know maybe i hope the work that the commission has done here will you know provides that agreed thank you chris i agree with that the next question that we have um coming in is now that the teprp is published what work remains to be done? So now that the policy has been published, what remains to be done to make, um, make the policy effective? Yeah. Either, either um, of you gentlemen can respond. Well, well um, certainly the, the telecommunication emergency preparedness agreement, um, of that uh, is still pending the, the finalization of that between Flo and Digicel. The, published, the policy certainly was published. The government is aware of the policy. DDME um, was a part of our working group. Um, certainly, they and their regulations and ordinance, they have set guidelines for hurricane disasters. And so the telecommunication preparedness and, and response policies is just to add, add to what they are um, in, in regards to what they have to do. So it's a guideline where 
DDME and, and certainly Sedema as well, if they come on board, can go and say, okay, this is what the telecommunications is, um, services is expected to do. Um, another thing that needs to be done is the to fix the importation um, of equipment, the core network equipment, where, um, as Chris mentioned, and I mentioned in, early, in my early presentation, where there were some bureaucracy that exists in importing um, equipment. You, you can imagine in a, in a disaster, um, you have all industry, um, the utility industry, water, private sectors, who are certainly trying to get their produce inside, uh, food and telecommunication service, in some cases, may not have seemed such of a priority. Food certainly is essential of, 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 of supplies is important. And so we're trying to establish a policy where to, to remove in the time of disaster, remove that bureaucracy. So we have talks with government now um, to establish a policy to forego all of the, the, the requirements. Um, it just stands now, um, you had to, the service provider had to write to the agency to get core equipment um, duty exempt. And so we are lobbying, uh, we encouraging government to remove that during the time of the disaster. Thank you, Kendra, thank you. Yes, Can I come Chris, in? Because yes, actually I think very neatly, in addition to what Kenva says, in answering that question, I can pick up the question from Mr. Davis, which is in the chat. Um, his question is, now that the TEPRP is done, one of the steps identified is the creation of an annual telecoms sector disaster vulnerability report by 31st of May. Will these be published for others to learn from as well? Um, so thanks for that question, Craig. It's a really, so in answer to the question, what remains to be done? Well, you know, by, by April, the operators will have to come up with their preparedness reports. And then by the end of May, the commission will produce the document that you've just referenced. Um, really good question. Will it be published or not? I, I don't think that's something that we've covered in our discussion so far. But what, so I would defer to Kemva, and it's maybe a discussion that we need to have um, offline. But I think, you know, what we're mindful of is um, the in industry will be sharing potentially confidential information with the Commission uh, through the creation of its reports every year. Um, and so we, the Commission will probably need to be um, quite careful about their about any publication of information about the status of network preparedness, for example. Um, so, sorry, that's not a clear answer because I don't think we've actually well, addressed I can add to it. Certainly, the yeah. commission is responsible for reporting um, the industry and the gas telecommunication and the preparedness. And so that is something that's going to come from the commission. So the service provider will give us their confidential information as to where we are, and the commission will then create a summary and, 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 and speak in its entirety where the sector is. And so that is a report that the commission certainly can make available to the public because it's something that we normally do. Nonetheless. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Ken. I thank you, Chris. We have two minutes, so I'm going to wrap up with the final question. And then um, I, so we have like a minute to respond to the final question. Then I will, re, I will just advise you, ladies and gentlemen, as to what's next on the Canto agenda. So the final question here is how can other stakeholders in the region benefit from your work? We have been having that discussion um, all morning, but um, if you could wrap up for us, please, as to how this work to benefit the rest of the region. Ken and Chris, you have like a minute to do that, gentlemen. And then we will uh, wrap up the session, which ends at 10. So that's in two minutes. Please go ahead, gentlemen. Yes, sure. So yes, I mean, we partnered with Kento um, to get our information out there. Uh, we realized that this work was, was important in the fact that we partnered, um, the, this policy was created with, with digital and flow, and digital and flow, when I speak about digital and flow regionally. And so it had uh, this, the, the executives of both digital and flow part of the working group. And so we don't want to reinvent the wheel. And, and so the fact that we all agree and came together with such a, an informative policy, we feel that if we partnered with, with Kento, um, certainly the information can, can go there and, and, and regulate us around the region. Uh, we will be partnering with them likewise in forming OCA um, to adopt um, this policy. Um, and so that is that is the, the end game. The, the Prime Minister of the, the, the Premier of the Turks and Caicos is aware of the policy likewise, um, where we hope to en engage with, with, with um, 
the, the regional um, body where they can inform their counterparts um, to adopt such a, a policy character as an organization I was thinking about. Yeah. Can I just add, I've, pro I've got about 10 seconds, right? So the only thing I'd add to that, uh, the only, so I think there's a huge regional opportunity yes. and synergy. Um, the, 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 the difference is that slightly different starting point in TCI because we had DDME and their document set, and that was our starting point. I suspect there'll be something slightly different in each jurisdiction. So you can blend the, the lessons from TCI with something that needs to pick up local conditions as well. Um, uh, and I hope that I hope this will enable that to happen. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Ken Bright, Director General, TCI Commission, Kendall Williams, Chris Taylor from consulting from Sinerva. Thank you for taking us through this morning on emergency preparedness policy and the agreement that is being worked on by Digicel and Flo for the, the Turks and Caicos Islands. And thank you for also taking us through how this could be deployed in some other countries. Thank you so very much for your time, gentlemen, and for sharing your expertise. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Kenva Williams. Thank you, Chris Taylor. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Just before you go, let me tell you what's coming up next on Canter Conversation. Please stay with me just a few more seconds. Um, we will have the next conversation on April 12th at 10 a.m. AST. It says a data tsunami is about to break. Will tell us to be able to ride the wave. And this presentation will be made by Andrea Canessi, Senior Director of Communications Industry at Oracle. Again, April 12th at 10 a.m., a data tsunami is about to break. Will tell us to be able to ride the wave. So please join us April 12th, 10 a.m. AST. Remember Canto um, exhibition and trade show July 2017th to 20th, Miami, Florida and May 10th for the Nerva and Canto Regulatory Master Training Program. So remember these dates, please put them in your calendar and come back and join us on April 12th. Again, many thanks, Kento Williams, Chris Taylor, Nerva. Thank you so very much. Secretary General, is there anything that you wish to say to our audience before we go or are we good? You've said everything that I wanted to say, Director. Well done, Kenva, Chris, and Director Sutherland. Mark the dates, and we'll see you soon. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so very much for joining us. Have yourself a wonderful day. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.